Iran. Mm. Now, England fans will be looking forward to the game. Yeah. And the expectation is, well, get through that quite comfortably. Yeah. You formulate a different argument. I'm not sure. I mean, for one, England are in pretty bad form. Um, I mean, I was interviewing Afshin Gotbi, who's a former national team coach of Iran, uh, was brought up in America. He's got an incredible story. He left after the revolution, uh, went to California, then became a coach and was actually in the 98 squad uh, as behind the scenes, mm. uh, tr trying to tell the team about the US team, about the Iran squad just before they played in that famous uh, match in 98 when Iran beat USA in... 2-1 uh, and there was like a million people on the streets of Tehran afterwards so uh, you know I was talking to him about it and he was like you know straight away he zeroed in on the weaknesses which is you know weakness in central defence weaknesses in goal uh, we have a plethora of talents everywhere else that gives Iran an opportunity now Iran most people probably aren't following Iranian football or really see many Iranian players I, mean, I, can, only, I can think of Yakimbash who played for Brighton and he didn't pull up any trees whilst he was there, although he'd scored for fun in the, in the Dutch league. But um, they do have, in Mehdi Tarimi, fantastic striker. They've got three strikers, the front three, fluid, extremely uh, competent. I mean, he scored five goals in Champions League, two assists, same as Messi, I think. I mean, Messi has eight, eight goals and assists. Um, he's going to be playing in the, in the knockout stages with Porto. Um, and then you've got Sada Azmoun, again, another uh, battering ram of a striker, who, if he's fit... Um, it's going to cause us uh, plenty of problems as well. They also have a world-class coach in Carlos Quiroz, and this is his third World Cup with Iran, which sounds uh, amazing, but it's his third World Cup with Iran. At the last World Cup, and that was, I think, a weaker team, uh, he came within seconds of knocking, uh, well, Portugal out of the World Cup, of getting Iran into the second round. They had a group of Morocco, who were probably the best team in Africa at the time, Spain and Portugal. Uh, they didn't embarrass themselves. So I think it's, uh, you know, and then on top of that, there's, Massive protest going on back home in Iran. Um, the players have been embroiled in it. I think that's going to have a kind of rallying, Galvanize. unifying, a galvanising effect. And so when I look at that group and I think England are in disarray, the, the, the national team, you know, national football in England is, you know, is in a bit of a crisis in terms of, you know, it's, it's difficult for people to love it, the na English national team for, for whatever. There's myriad, myriad reasons for that. Not a problem. Well, is a problem now for Iran because of the political situation. But they, there's a galvanising reason for them to come together. Wales. I was just in Wrexham at the Valgoch, um a book festival, football fan festival. You know, Welsh flag was everybody. Everybody was so proud about Wales getting to the world first World Cup final since '58. You know, they're going to be an absolute handful. They're going to desperately want to beat England. Iran. The lit they will desperately want to beat the little Satan, you know, as, as we refer to sometimes. And of course, their last game is against the great Satan, the US, and they replay that 98 game. So they, they're motivated. Everybody's motivated. The team that doesn't have the motivation in the group is England. And I feel, well, I mean, I was, we were talking about whether I should put a bet on this, but my prediction is that the, England might lose all three games, go home early, and Iran gets out of the group. Which, well, you're upsetting every English. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I mean, it's, you know, oh, no. I, I, you know I, love, I love England, I love national football, but I mean, you know, I can see, I can see the banana skins a mile off, and I think, I think Iran is a massive banana skin. And you can see in the interviews with the Iranian players, I mean, Yakanbash gave this quite, I mean, Infantino-esque answer at the press conference uh, the other day when he was asked about the uh, uprising in Iran and about the fact that the, the players have been asked to back calls to uh, improve women's rights in Iran and, and, and back these protests. And, you know, it's rather than saying yes or um, saying, well, this is politics, I can't talk about it, it's a difficult situation for me. You know, he kind of gave a kind of punchy answer saying this is a conspiracy that you're bringing this up to kind of throw us off, off our stride, which mm. has not endeared him at all to the uh, internet sphere, social media space in Iran, which is teeming with people. I mean, this is a country of 80 million people. Instagram is huge. I mean, their biggest players have tens of millions of followers and it's a, it's a febrile debate that's taking place over there. But I think, you know, given, given the, the, the background to all of these things, Iran, an, an extremely competent club, a team, with Carlos Quiroz, who's a world-class coach. And mm. I think we, we underestimate them at their peril, at our peril. You talk about the unrest then mm. in Iran. Uh, has there been any calls in Iran that they shouldn't be playing? There's been lots of calls. I mean, there's a, there's a fantastic uh, a activist can network called Open Stadiums. Um, and when I went to Iran in 2018, I actually, we had to be very careful because speaking to foreign journalists would almost certainly get you a 
one-way trip to Evin Prison. But we met secretly and we spoke to, I spoke to her about her activism to try and allow women to go to football stadiums where they're effectively banned. Yes. And so this issue of, um, of, of women in, in football has been, it was there at the 2018 World Cup and now because of this uprising, what's happening is there's very few public spaces in Iran where, I mean, it doesn't have a very free press. Um, Instagram and Telegram are places where people can talk about, but um, film stars, pop stars, footballers, you know, high profile people are expected to kind of stand with the people. And they've, they've been found to be a bit lacking in that. And that part of the reason for that is, you know, the Iranian regime, as we've seen in the news, can be, will punish your family for that. They, they, will, they will extract the price if you speak publicly. I mean, even now, uh, the former great, I don't know if you've ever, if you ever came across Ali Karimi, who was at Bayern Munich. I mean, I think he might, Ali Karimi might be the best player I've ever seen in the flesh, <laughs> which is like, as in with my own eyes at the mm, stadium. Mm. Incredible player. He was brought into um, Bayern Munich to replace Michael Ballack, but he broke his ankle and he never quite reached that, that level. Um, and he's been very open and very um, critical of the government. And he's had to flee. He's now in exile in uh, in Dubai, he's a retired player now, but he's he's in exile now in Dubai, and, and uh, you know he's wanted on charges of kind of essentially sedition. So that tells you how difficult the situation is is for the players. But um, this is you know this is a problem that is 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 not going to go away. But you can tell what Carlos Quiroz is very good at is creating an us versus them bunker mentality, mm -hmm. and that's exactly when you, you hear Yakubash's uh, comments, you can tell exactly that's what he's doing. Yeah. We, we hear that the way that Iran will set up will be a low block, which mm -hmm. England find quite difficult at times yeah. to break down teams like that. Is that how they normally that's play? That's exactly how they'll play. Mm -hmm. And when I was speaking to Afshin Gotbi, who's a very, very smart coach, that's exactly what he said. They're going to set up low block. They're not, they're, you know, there's just going to be 11, well, 10 men, nine men behind the ball. Um, there's going to be so little space. And as we've seen with England, we have no idea how to unlock that. Mm -hmm. And he's... As, as every um, uh, Iranian fan has, has kind of is hoping for as well, got to be pointed out. They will just need one opportunity because they have clinical finishers. Those three the front and three with pace, with pace yeah. um, and guile, and they, they you give them a chance and they will take it. And I think it's going to be if whatever happens, it's going to be a very close game. Famous last words. They'll probably get tonked five nil now. Probably. <laughs> No, but I think most are expecting it to be a close game just because of the fact that England do struggle yeah. against teams that come with that defence first mentality and that like you say they then have the pace to break and, and that could be a big issue for, for England. I was going to ask you about Qatar and Saudi yeah. Arabia, where they stand. Are Iran the best of the, the three? I think so. Middle? I think Iran have the best chance. Um, Saudi Arabia has always been the, the kind of powerhouse of, of Middle Eastern football uh, traditionally because it's just a bigger country. They're, you know, it's, they have big big football culture there and uh but then you saw it 2018 it didn't go so well they had they, because they've got a lot of money i, I actually went and met uh, Sal, salam el dasari who was probably one of their best players and they'd they paid for a lot of their players to go to la liga to get like a season or half a season's um experience and it didn't quite work out they never really got broke into they took the money the clubs and Villarreal signed him and he had a couple of games and did okay but They'll be, they'll be one to look for. I think the surprise package playing today is Qatar because everybody, there's been so much talked about Qatar uh, that actually hardly anyone's talked about the football, but people have forgotten. I mean, actually, I heard the news, news guys say, oh, this is their first major game at a major tournament. Well, it's not. I mean, they're Asian champions. Mm. They won the Asian Cup in 2019. That's the equivalent of the European Championships. That's a big tournament. That's a tournament that Japan or South Korea would win. And so to look at, well, Japan in particular, but so... This is the entire country and the entire strategic, and if we've learned something about Qatar, it's about how strategic they are in their thinking. Um, they built the Aspire Academy in 2005, and I was at the opening of the Aspire Academy, and Pele and Maradona turned up. They paid millions of pounds for them to come together on the stage together. It's quite an experience to see them talking to each other, and or seeing that Maradona play football. And this is kind of a talent uh, spotting exercise, a global talent search, and they have found not quite, I mean, in the past there was a lot of um, naturalizations of players, but what they've done is they've brought players from across the region who have been born, some in Qatar, some in Sudan, Iraq, Egypt, other places like that, and they've come from the age of five or six, they've lived here, and, you know, have 
become Qatari and now play for this national team. And they've all gone through the national team setups together. And they've been given the opportunity to go. They went and played in uh, Copper America uh, just before the pandemic where they, they did OK. Did OK. They got to the semi-final of the Gold Cup, I think, against uh, uh, getting the loss to the US, 1-0, but did OK. They were, they were a ghost team in World Cup qualification for, for uh, UEFA. Mm-hmm. They were put in one of the groups yeah. as, a kind of a, as, a, as a friendly. Again, I think they would have finished third I- in that group. You've got, and in the Asian Cup 2019, they become Asian champions. They concede one goal, I think it was, uh, against Japan in the final. They've got a fantastic young striker called Alma Rizali, who, I mean, again a player that would, I think, thrive in Europe if given the opportunity. Um, Akrima Fief, this, again, another brilliant, uh, uh, more of a winger, could play as a wing-back. Uh, you have uh, Hassan Haidus, the captain. Uh, he's getting on a bit now. Well, getting on, he's 32. He's 11 <laughs> years younger than me. Seems weird <laughs> saying that. But, um, you know, they have a, a team that is full of, of, like, this generational talent that they have been slowly building up exactly for this first game today and in in coach Felix Sanchez you know he came from Barcelona's academy he's been there for five years there was a bit of pressure about his job as well because I, I spoke to Xavi a few years ago when he was out here playing for Al Saad and he was coaching at Al Saad every Qatari wanted uh, wanted Xavi to take over or Pep Guardiola to take over a big name to take over and they decided Oh, no, we're going to keep him. Going to keep him, and they do play like a like a little Barcelona, and mm. you know Ecuador, you know, aren't to be sniffed at. It's a tough group. They probably might, probably won't get out of the group. But I think everybody's expecting kind of ten nil, kind of tonking, and I'm I'm not sure that's going to happen, especially not at home. The I mean the pressure on them after twelve years of build up and being essentially kind of coached their entire lives to this moment is going to be insane. But if they can handle that, then, then they're going to be prepared for it.